Welcome back to Vertical Thoughts. I'm joined here today by uh, by these guys. Wow. <laughs> Starting beautiful. off right. Yeah, that's, that's the way, I guess. That's why people listen to this, actually. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Burping ASMR. I would expect that, yeah. Your yeah. number one source, yeah. Yeah, yeah fuel it up, buddy. Mm. <laughs> Get yeah, the next one locked and coming. <laughs> so we have uh, a couple couple very special guests here today. We have uh, Atre, damn that boy thick, Mac. Oh, that's me. Yeah. And, uh, and that's Sam, the first nickname. Sam the Lion Palacios. Hey, hello. Mm. Hey, were you waving there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Wave to the fans. Um, so both setters, Vital Climbing Gym. If you haven't been, you're missing out. Go check it out. Which reminds me, we'll take a brief caveat to remind you guys that on June 15th, which as of the time of this releasing will be this coming Saturday, um, we, I'm assuming we all probably will be uh, at the birthday bash. Oh, we'll be there at six in the morning. Oh yeah, they'll, we're there. I'll be there. I'll be there s- not at six in the morning. <laughs> Dude, we need foreigners. Yeah. I'll be there six in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier than I expected, but you know what? That's why we're here. That's probably why you guys came on today, huh? <laughs> Corner mm-hmm. me into this. <laughs> That's right. So um, we, uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about the unsung heroes of rock climbing. That's a generous statement. <laughs> I feel like rock are very demonized. <laughs> <laughs> the unsung demons of rock climbing. The construction workers. <laughs> exactly. The, the necessary evil. Yeah. We're here to talk about uh, a lot of stuff, actually. A lot of requests, just in general, from listeners, viewers, of just across the board, just like bring on rock setters. Like, we want to hear from rock setters. I think the average climber doesn't know their local route setters very well and doesn't get to talk to them very much about setting because i mean you put it this way like you step into their shoes for a minute you're just at the gym you're climbing and you see the route setters there and they're just chilling you probably don't want to just be like hey what's up so route setting right yeah yeah. (laughs) because they probably just got done setting or probably talk it's like it's like uh going up to someone who works i don't know in construction just being like knock down some walls today or what (laughs) Shut up, dude. <laughs> Whatever. I feel like all we do is talk about setting and climbing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you, if you have local setters and you haven't talked to them about setting, I promise you they probably want to talk about setting. Yeah. I remember like approaching setters, like when I was starting climbing, like just asking them the dumbest questions, but yeah, you know, that's all those nerds love talking about it. Oh yeah. Setters are all across the board nerds. Right? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Every single one. Super climbing nerd. And if you don't think you are, you're a fucking liar. You're a nerd. <laughs> nerd <laughs> um okay so first of all thank you both for joining me today thank you for thanks, having us thanks for having us of course i'm glad, excited glad to have you here we just got done climbing i have the chalky shirt and some probably leftover vascularity mm. to confirm that i noticed thank you yeah i'm covered in volume paint i'm ready to go <laughs> i had changed i'm very prepared <laughs> you look great <laughs> um we'll start with uh, some some basics um Atre, we'll start with you how long have you been setting for I was actually thinking about this. I don't know. <laughs> I think I've been sitting for like four, maybe five years, maybe six years. There was like somewhere I, there. Yeah. When I started, I was like doing it once every couple of months. Okay. And then like once every couple of weeks for free for the free membership. Yeah. Back in the dirty days. And then, uh, probably, but like full time, probably from 2016, I would say. Okay. Three, four years, something like that. Mm. Sam, what about you? It's been about, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, right the mic. It's been probably almost three and a half years. Okay. Like right in the transition when Autre was taking over headsetting for Vital, California. Yeah. And I started off as an apprentice for a couple months with Lewis and the whole team. Um, I was forerunning a lot. Yeah. And I think that's how I got in. Yeah. Makes sense. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Stepping to the gateway drug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess I've been... Must have been setting for more than three years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck I'm thinking. <laughs> Sam's on three. You're probably a little longer. Yeah, yeah probably. Probably in closer to that six range, I guess. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. You're you're a veteran. Yeah, I'm ready. Ready for anything. Welcome you're to a, the show. You're a, more than a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like in first grade. <laughs> yeah. Learn my ABCs, I'm good. <laughs> I, was, I was reading an article recently. Um, I'm sincerely apologize i don't remember what website i was reading it on um but it was an interview with the uh the head setter of the ifsc and again don't remember his name so my bad (laughs) to the climbing community but maybe couldn't pronounce it even if i remembered it but um he was talking about like age and like veteranship with climbing and saying like they constantly bring in young climbers because in order to set at that level you have to climb hard however the longer you set 
your climbing kind of declines, but your experience goes up. So he was talking about there's it's this weird like curve the intersection yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of like experience and skill. And the more you set, the less you climb. And so, you know, the worse you get. And, but he was saying like the uh, interviewer asked the question, like, does that mean you have to push out like the veteran setters? Like <laughs> you just bump them out <laughs> and he was like, oh, they just retire. Yeah. He didn't say no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's something that I never would have thought of as being like a young man's game, but I guess it makes sense. Like the more experienced setters, of course, are going to be around for a while. You yeah. know what I mean? But after a certain period, the climbing, your fitness probably just declines naturally mm-hmm. unless mm-hmm. you're climbing a ton. When you're setting at that level, it's not like uh, throwing up like, you know, 15, 20 plus climbs at a gym and then you get, you know, you forerun them all. When you're setting like five really hard climbs, you probably don't do a ton of like actual forerunning on the wall. Right. Probably just individual isolation. And that forerunning is brutal. Yeah. I can imagine. Like, I feel like a, a big goal of setting is to forerun as the least amount as you can. Yeah. That's just like the economical like necessity yeah. of like maintaining your energy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It makes sense. Like we're doing four days a week right now and it's been getting real hard. Yeah. But we are also like the strongest that we've been. Yeah. Yeah. So we're still at that, that pinnacle where like our skill is still increasing. Mm hmm. But I don't know how long I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> Wearing you down. <laughs> um, how often do you guys climb just for climbing's sake? Not for running or setting, competing, anything like that? Um, maybe if it's off season, probably like one recreational day in the gym. Okay. Like a, a week? Yeah. You? Yeah. Like it's like intermixed. Like after a set, we'll go session the tension board or just like. Yeah. You know, climb a little bit true. on the sets afterwards. Whatever our, feels right. Yeah, yeah. Use our boy tokens and such. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to fit in like full, full effort, like self climbing days. It's like, I don't know what my last one was. <laughs> like, yeah. Like projecting days. Yeah. You're like going hard. It's like, dude, I got a safe skin for tomorrow. The sets in the cave. And it's like, eh, yeah. that's all right. Like I, I climbed on Sunday. We had a set on Monday and I did not do well at all. But then I felt great Monday. I don't know. That's a weird thing. Yeah. It's fickle. But during season, I feel like we still set four days a week, at least Autry and I, and then mm. I try to go out at least once yeah. every other weekend. Yeah, the psych is high enough to, yeah. to yeah. push through. Just pull it together. Because you get, uh, is your last day of setting like Thursday usually? Yeah. Thursday. So then you get a couple day break. Yeah. Yep. Rock it during the weekend. At least Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Rest Sunday do it all over again <laughs> yeah the endless cycle <laughs> yeah we're all trapped in it just sink into the monotony if you haven't already by the way <laughs> life is monotony <laughs> have fun with it whatever and make sure every monday morning at 9 a.m you listen to vertical thoughts <laughs> add that to your routine speaking of resting i'm really comfy dude yeah these are great chairs i, I like these long asleep you look so comfy thanks dude very relaxed <laughs> do you want to go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> lull you guys into my studio Make you fall asleep on camera and then just ruthlessly make fun of you. <laughs> <Those idiots>. <laughs> 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 just like start dumping things in your mouth. <laughs> All right. So we're going to dive into some, I don't know, I wouldn't call it like theoretical question, questionizing questionnaires, but um, rock climbing and, and more specifically route setting. Um, there's questions I think that don't get asked a lot, but that have a lot of intri- intri- intricacy to them. <laughs> it's my first podcast. So <laughs> thanks for having me on, by the way, guys. <laughs> You're doing great, buddy. Really excited. <laughs> um, so there's intricacies that, that kind of get skipped over because most people don't just, I guess, do what I did, which is take like a couple hours and sit down and just like think critically about route setting. <laughs> and I don't set, you know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. a, different, a different conversation for me. But there's some questions that came to mind um, specifically. And, and one of them was um, how, if at all, uh, do you think that the growth of rock climbing in general, specifically with social media, in other words, the growth of, of the presence of rock climbing on social media um, has skyrocketed the last few years? There's On Instagram specifically, there's a huge climbing audience. I mean, mm-hmm. hashtag rock climbing will pull up millions and millions of results. Four years ago, three years ago, it wasn't like that. And so it's it's been kind of recent. Um, and specifically, you know, if you go and type in like hashtag route setting or hashtag boulder problem, you get a lot of results. So route setting or people's individual route setting has been made publicly available to everyone, you know, around the world. Um, how do you think that that has affected route setting in general? Do you think that people, 
I guess, you know, it, maybe it hasn't negatively or positively affected it, but do you think that um, the spreading of people's individual, I don't know, styles, I guess, do you think that that like dilutes route setting as a whole or, or what do you think about that? Um, I, I think it, it hasn't like negatively or positively impacted um, like the craft of setting or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But um, I think there's like, almost like a sense of like individualism mm -hmm. f as far as like you're posting your routes or like I look online and I know that like this guy set this route. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Like, so I, I think it just brings that connectivity amongst setters. I yeah. don't know what it is from the other side of the lens. I've been a setter the entire time I've been climbing basically. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just like a sense of ownership and individualism. Yeah. I think almost the opposite, honestly. <laughs> What do you mean? I think uh, there's been like a lot of homogenization between climbing. Okay. Like I, I find myself often like seeing these cool movements or routes, whatever, on Instagram. I'm like, that's pretty inspirational, and I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna see what I can do. Like maybe I can do something like that. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. to just to test myself, honestly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That, it, it hasn't always existed like that specifically where like there's like route setter magazine and stuff like that but i mean up until recently if you wanted to take inspiration for route setting specifically it's either like you know like big stage competition climbing mm -hmm. or outdoors yeah right or other gyms i guess yeah, yeah. that's always thing but. It, i guess it does kind of like contribute to like the uh collective like route setting like you see the move that you know somebody else said on instagram you like set it on monday yeah and like see how it works for you and how it fits in your gym um so yeah i see what you're saying yeah you but, can see it like making route climbing or route climbing route setting as a whole kind of like shift directions i guess quicker you know and if someone develops a new style that is cool more people will see it faster and adopt it and then it'll move quicker i mean everything moves quicker in the digital age but mm -hmm. maybe that's one part of it yeah i feel like this whole presence of social media has really um like catalyzed this comp style that we're all seeing yeah um it seems like everybody wants to see it and everybody wants to play on it too yeah and i think we're we're trying to do an okay job with that yeah but that's a balance but that's yeah. not like that's not how we see all of route setting right it's just one more style yeah. that we could add yeah, if you look at like some of the top uh route route setting um instagrams like the last 20 pictures are like a coordination dyno yeah which i think is sick to look at but like you know some variety is nice so. yeah not probably not realistic for every climb yeah yeah or like i understand that that isn't every climb in those gyms that they're setting for but if that's the portrayal of route settings that that's like every climb is that you know yeah that's the kind of stuff that they're excited to share right totally and i guess probably because that stuff's just more exciting to watch totally i yeah, mean yeah. The, the viewership plays a big part in it and it's a very common criticism that's levied against route setting or rock climbing as a whole the last few years is the the parkour thing you know what i mean it's just parkour now it's not climbing um i've heard that i've seen it on the internet i've heard it come out of people's mouths you know i don't do this parkour that you know for me um i really like that style you know the new kind of competition style that we're seeing that's requires maybe more athleticism than just raw strength mm -hmm. or you know coordination like you were saying stuff like that um, I, I don't see it as a negative thing. How, how does that come across to you guys that, that criticism that people levy against climbing of just like it's parkour now, basically. I think that's just an easy excuse yeah. for not expanding your skill set. Um, I think every style of climbing from, you know, the hand jams at the, uh, that finals in Munich or wherever it was right. to the million coordination dinos, I think like that all fits in the puzzle of, of rock climbing and becoming a better climber. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. I I have nothing to add because that was great. Yeah, that was really cool. And I think, was it, you were close. I think it was it Maringen. When I think it was Maringen. The, Maringen, the, yeah. The, yeah. That was awesome. It was that, so good. Yeah. Men's four was a crack climb. <laughs> and it's it's funny to see how people will talk shit on coordination dinos being everywhere. Yeah. But then as soon as a hand crack comes in, talks everyone mad shit. talks <laughs> so much shit on that. That was, in my opinion, that was a very baller move by the setters. It was, it was <laughs> yeah, baller, totally. yeah. Like a power move first three climbs were kind of that coordination style and then it's like boom mm -hmm. shove your hands in there he made it look it, like a, you? <laughs> made it look like a v4 adam andre you mean yeah uh, yeah yeah like i think he, he called that thing like like five five twelve or something yeah, like that maybe like hard five eleven yeah 
which I believe uh, if you don't practice it, 5.11 crack is fucking hard. Yes, <laughs> yes. And seeing some real strong names get just shut down by that thing prior. I mean, I think uh, I think uh, Jong Wan Chan almost did some kind of weird skip. Dude, he was close. Yeah, 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 he close. skipped yeah. the crack. And that was pretty cool. And like, that's... Uh, the route setters had to have known that was possible mm-hmm. and i'm sure we're encouraging some kind of skip but i'm sure it was harder than oh yeah 511 crack yeah, you yeah. know what i mean um but it's I, I think you're right i think people saying oh that kind of style of climbing that's you know that's parkour that's not rock climbing i think for the most part anyone saying that's not rock climbing is like almost laziness to me mm-hmm. it's just like you see something that is maybe new to you or maybe maybe you're not coordinated maybe you can't do it so you're just like yeah, that's yeah i mean it's it's easy to dismiss yeah it's for me i think it's just another way to use the toys that we have yeah it might as well explore everything yeah and and then there's the delineation of people like well would you see that outdoors would you see any of this outdoors (laughs) really i mean it's if you if you look at uh does that climb in rocklands it's el El corazon right so one-handed yeah yeah like you totally see that stuff outdoors it's just you might not know about it i guess (laughs) right and it's not as obvious i guess yeah. you know like the, the the placement of holds and stuff like that but um i think that in my opinion anyways indoor climbing and outdoor climbing are, are disparate in that way i don't think they should try to be exactly like each other. i agree i totally, totally agree and it's competition climbing specifically because it's it's very different right like you guys are saying when you're setting for a gym of people um those are consumers you know and you guys are providing the climbs for them so it's important that if every climb was like that consumership would probably drop a little bit mm-hmm we end up yeah. some just weird people. Yeah. Just a bunch of Liam's in there. <laughs> <laughs> just me. <laughs> I, I remember when, uh, it was a couple years ago when Zach Monzoni, who's also on your podcast uh-huh. not too long ago, um, the three of us used to be the core setters for Vital okay. California. And we got a lot of negative feedback about us setting only crimp climbs and drive-bys. Uh-huh. And... That was really hard to accept, but yeah, and we we realized that we we need to diversify how we define hard climbs, yeah, and so we need to get better as climbers and setters to you know emulate that. That's good, um, yeah, yeah, because to I mean, at the very base level, in, in order to put it up on the wall correctly or in a coherent way, you know, for the most part, I think a lot of people would agree that you got to be able to do it. Not every climb, obviously, you can set something that's above your pay grade, but um, oftentimes that's what forerunning is for. You'd have someone there to forerun that can climb that hard um, for that kind of stuff. But um, I think it's really cool, the process, I guess the way that that works, but it is give and take with the feedback, right? Is you're, you're setting for an audience. Um, and would you guys say that, like your style, your climbing style, I guess. Everyone like, mine is kind of the more competition style climbs really cater more to my, I guess, body type or physicality or something like that. So I tend to like those more. Um, I could totally see if I was route setting a lot of that stuff, making its way into my climbs. Um, do you find your style kind of shining through the cracks a lot or, or do you focus mainly on your audience? Uh, I think the focus should always be that you're catering to the audience and the, the customer, but like naturally those tendencies do, do peek through. Yeah. So, um, yeah, totally. Like, yeah, I, I set Autre boulders and Sam sets Sam boulders, but yeah. we try to do a lot of, you know, in between setting weird stuff. Yeah. Imagine myself as a 12 year old girl and set for that. You got to do it in and out of the gym. I think a good route setter can set outside of their style. Yeah. And outside their grade. Yeah. And that's really important to us. So we often challenge each other or like challenge our team and say like, hey, Ryan, you need to set a... This, this happened on Monday. Like you need to set a V6 that is completely opposite of what you usually do. And and he did it. He did a great job. Yeah. Interesting. It's, yeah. I think that's really important yeah. to us. Yeah, or you'd like have one setter choose the holds for another setter or like tell them specifically, hey, emulate this outdoor climb, like force them out of their box. And yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably, especially setting a high uh, quantity of climbs, you know what I mean? We were setting four days a week and you guys set a lot of climbs. Um, I think without that kind of accountability, it's probably pretty easy to slip into some kind of routine, you know, yeah. and, and kind of get the same thing stuck in your head. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. Um, the diversity really speaks in climbing. And I think uh, climbers notice that 
you know, very specifically where climbers will come into a gym and the, the consumers, I guess, if you will, you know, come into a new set. And if there's diversity on the wall, it's like the first thing they're going to notice is like, it's like coming into like a Disneyland, like a playground. Like, Look at all this cool stuff that I get to try. And so, as opposed to like, like you're saying, where people come in and every once in a while, you just get people that come in, like, look at all these crimps, man. And you don't want to ride Space Mountain 15 times, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. and it, <laughs> it's a lot of crimps. I'm sick of getting wet on Splash Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Drenched. <laughs> just want to ride the Star Wars ride. <laughs> but yeah, I think... Um, that's something that's good to keep in mind. I think when you're being a consumer, speaking as a consumer of route climbing, route climbing, I'm going to say that every time I try to say rock climbing this episode, <laughs> route climbing. Uh, that's what we're talking about, man. Rock setting. They're the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> route climbing and rock setting. Every time I'm climbing, I try to kind of keep setters in mind. And we forget, I think, as consumers that it's not a machine that puts climbs up on the wall, that it's people and you know, they have strengths and weaknesses and they, I think acknowledging your strengths and weaknesses is a huge part of being a setter. I would assume, you know what I mean? Knowing that if something's hard for you, doesn't necessarily mean it's hard for someone else or the opposite way around. Um, but as a climber too, you, you, it's important to keep in mind that route setters, I mean, it's like the whole support your local route setter thing, like route setters are people and not every climb is four stars because that wouldn't even make sense. I mean, not everything can be an amazing right. climb. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying <laughs> we don't all only set everyone else, four but stars. Sam's climbs. <laughs> <laughs> Sam climbs are four and a half every time. <laughs> no, but it's just, I don't know. For me, what you make of the climb to me is more important than what the climb actually is. Mm -hmm. I think that there's intricacy that setters specifically put into climbs that maybe climbers ignore sometimes. They're just like, mm -hmm. ah, that move's stupid. Like, maybe it's stupid because you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's some cool beta that you're missing or something like that. Um, and it's, it's tricky, but you, you mentioned outdoor climbing a little bit, you know, you base something off of an outdoor climb. I know there's no set percentage. And I asked, uh, Zach Manzani this question too, but how heavily does outdoor climbing influence your setting indoors? Uh, I think a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I think that's like the, the source of all setting, right? Maybe, maybe not for me personally, but like that's, the root of our sport right yeah so started outdoors naturally and came indoors right yeah um and like sometimes i'll, I'll talk to the setters and, and say like hey set a climb that like emulates like a v7 granite climb or like what the, what does that even mean but yeah. like that still like translates to you know something indoors yeah so i think it's obviously a huge influence big part of it totally yeah. and that's that's a big part of my inspiration like I love setting because I love climbing. And so when I get to climb outside on the weekends, I learn new things and I want to share that with everybody. Yeah. And I've, I've just learned so much. Uh, yeah. Stuff. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah. I mean, you, that's a good point because, um, I would, I would wager to guess that a pretty small percentage of active gym climbers actually make it outdoors consistently at least now i don't think it used to be like that we talk about this all the time on the show but i think five years ago you found more climbers in climbing gyms mm -hmm. and now you find actually a lot more general public in climbing gyms mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those people outdoors is less accessible for them so being able to emulate that inside or at least part of the experience is i think that's something that's pretty special because when they do get to go outside it'll feel a little bit familiar mm -hmm. to them and even if they don't ever go outside they get that like the soul of outdoor climbing through setting i think that's the way it should be yeah yeah and it's um the i mean there's some things you can't emulate indoors but that's that's part of the experience you know experiencing something new outdoors for the first time and we, you know talking to our viewers and i know we have a lot of people that listen that actually don't climb very much or maybe are just getting into climbing or um you know so all this stuff may still be a little bit foreign to you but um it's not just you know with setters it's the other way around too climbing outdoors also will kind of lift up your experience indoors i find that if i go climb outside um i have a better time climbing indoors afterwards totally maybe my maybe i get like a reality check when i go outside and i realize that my technique has to be better than it is mm -hmm. um and then indoors i translate that i don't know what it is but after i come back from an outdoor session I, I always feel better and stronger indoors and i enjoy it more just climbing in general uh maybe that's just me maybe i'll go outdoors and go climb indoors and be like this sucks and I'll go back <laughs> outdoors <laughs> i honestly kind of feel that way yeah yeah like when I'm spending a lot of time outside, I will get better at climbing outside. Yeah. And then I'll get worse at climbing inside. And then 
my skin turns just a complete shit for inside. Yeah, that's and so true. I, no, yeah. it. I don't know. It's kind of like this balancing act that you have to play along with. That's interesting. I'm, I'm with you. I, I feel so much stronger indoors if I climb outdoors a bunch in a season. Um, except for the 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 skin, definitely. Right. Like it'll it'll not work for plastic after a while. Of yeah, hanging out in the buttermilks. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think a lot of professional climbers even kind of struggle with that, like balance, like. Uh, that was one of the things I, I chatted with, with Kai Leitner very briefly about his, uh, hiatus from competitive climbing. And that was one of the main things I asked him was, are you just going to climb outdoors more? You know, are, are you going to take your time and take it outdoors? And, and that was a big part of it for him. You know, just what he communicated to me was now I'll have time. You know, when you're on the circuit, the bouldering circuit, you know, traveling the world, going to different countries, you're training, 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 and then you're climbing and then maybe resting and then training. Uh, you don't really have time to go outdoors and just climb. No. And you see some... I was really impressed. I think it was uh, Yerne Cruder that was actually like posting outdoor climb <laughs> videos, and I was like, "Dude, aren't you like knees deep in the World Cup yeah. right now?" <laughs> it's cool when they like uh, they like they're there for the weekend, but then they take a little trip outside and you, like see them on Instagram stories and like, "Cool, these guys, these guys still they're rock climbing. climb." That's yeah, good. it's really really cool to it's see. It's like relieving. <laughs> they're not like all like laser focused on yeah. Olympics. Like, oh my god, that sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's probably hard for me. I feel like in that situation, it'd be hard for me not to just like maybe even disregard it, even though I would probably want to climb outdoors for me to just be like single-minded about like, I have a goal mm-hmm. and it's coming up next year. I don't have time. Like I just, I've right now, I feel like I don't have time to do things and I'm not competing on the circuit. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine, but yeah, I mean, and, and it alludes to what we were talking about earlier. Outdoor climbing is still training for indoor climbing. So, yeah. you know, I'm sure they, they think of it that way as well. At least a lot of them. Yeah. And they, it's, it also is interesting to see how it translates. I think sometimes for me is I forget, um, because the, the IFSC climbs, um, they're not set in V12s up there. You know what I mean? Because people don't really on site grades that high in two minutes, or at least very rarely. I think, I think if they did have like V12 plus climbs, like these people are pulling outdoors, I think it would get a lot of negative feedback or narrow down the climbing a little we bit. Have another eight years of uh, Daniel Woods. Number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He would he would come back on the circuit. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it, it's really hard to grade those kinds of uh, yeah those movements. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like it's not as straightforward as this climb is V blank, right? Because mm-hmm. you have to factor in like how coordinated am I, not how hard I'm pulling. Yeah, it's a lot easier to measure the latter. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. And I think that's that's why for the most part, I think a lot of those kind of competition style setters that they, they don't grade. You know, they don't have grades yeah. in mind. You know, it's just what's, what's cool, what feels difficult enough or what maybe mm-hmm. is attainable and what will separate the field more yeah. than more so than w- who can climb the hardest mm-hmm. yeah. is, is a big factor. Cause it's not, you know, it's not always about pulling the hardest, right? Someone's always going to pull the hardest. Yeah. I mean, no matter how hard you pull at your local gym, there's someone out there who pulls harder. It's just, it's just the way it goes. Mm. I do like the separation that the athleticism kind of like throws into the mix. And I mean, like you look at like the, uh, the Japan team specifically i mean those guys are good at that stuff oh yeah yep. I mean, lots of coordination lots of athleticism strength too they're all really strong you know what i mean i'm not saying they don't pull hard but there's there's more to the story i think than just like you said just you know this climbs v blank and it's hard you know have fun two minutes enjoy yeah. it and um, but you see some of those climbers take that outdoors um and they do pull really hard you know and i think that's cool to see like they don't they don't lose their touch. You know what I mean? It, mm-hmm. They can still pull in the higher grades, compete with those kinds of people. That's not just like Daniel, which just rolls in with a little CBD vial and just crushes every <laughs> IFSC comp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, we're glad that that's, I love Daniel Woods and I love seeing videos of him climb, but I'm, seeing him at the top of every podium in IFSC would be rough. <laughs> yeah. It's been a great season so far, by the way, speaking of, yeah, it's been awesome. IFSC. I, I think I, I missed last weekend, but this weekend is there. There wasn't one last weekend, but I missed the last stop. And then um, this weekend is the last two. Munich, was that the last one? Vale's coming up. I know that. Yeah, Vale's this weekend. Vale's coming up. Yeah, Munich was either so. the last one or the one before. I don't quite remember. Yeah, I don't remember the order. And it doesn't matter when this comes out because it'll probably be a different one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Vale was sick. <laughs> <laughs> Vail, go check it out. You haven't watched it yet? <laughs> no, because I remember because... Um, well, I won't spoil it for you, but watch the Munich one. It's good. Yeah. But the one thing that I like to see is that like the podiums have been so diverse. You see like 
That's yeah, crazy. The top three just switches mm-hmm. constantly. Some, some, some strong guys. Yeah, was yeah, was yeah, Munich that's... the one where Andre just blew it at the end? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm spoilers. <clears throat> I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> but but yeah, that separation. I think that's a that's a testament to the uh, we're not setting grades. You're setting like routes to separate the field. Yeah. And they're separating amongst like what 400 competitors. Like, yeah. For mm-hmm. years, it was the same three at the top. Now it's still. It's Yanya at the top every time, but sure. like everybody else is getting separated. <laughs> she's unstoppable. Yeah. She's a, a robot, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's she's crazy. Um, I like that's true actually. Now that I think about it, but I like with the uh, the men's climbing specifically, the first place has just been bouncing around like, back and forth. Yeah, and I mean, I think overall Adam Andre is still pretty significantly in the lead um, because he's placed well at every comp. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean. Like in Munich, um, someone else was at the top. I won't spoil it for you. Go back and watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's really interesting to see. And to come back to what we were saying, like, Andra can pull really hard. Yeah, maybe the hardest. Possibly, but yeah. that doesn't mean he's going to win every time. Yeah. And it's really cool to see these other guys take it. Yeah. And just and I think it comes down to those climbs. And I won't, I won't use the phrase low percentage because that's not what it is. It's coordination and timing you know what i mean and that kind of stuff that you normally if you're just cranking hard you know you you don't have time to think about all that stuff because you're you're just you're pulling but with climbs like that it comes down to a lot more than that and it's cool to watch too the spectatorship is something else with those type of climbs Mm -hmm. um and i think probably i don't know for sure but i'm I'm sure that those setters put a lot of time into how those climbs are going to look for the audience yeah how the movement's going to look absolutely it's a spectator sport at least now it is yeah which is cool to see so we got to you know, that's, um, I would imagine for them, that's kind of part of the grunt of it is the climbs not only have to look good. We know they got to be aesthetic. That's important. Oh yeah. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Nothing like some volumes, you know, a little symmetry. <laughs> I'm talking volumes on mon- volumes, volumes on volumes, little jib on a little jib, <laughs> on a little jib. <laughs> stack the jibs. Are you listening to <laughs> all of that's on a rope <laughs> on a rope? <laughs> Um, and that, that'll get Adam Andre. That'll stop yeah, him dead yeah. in his tracks. <laughs> um, but move, moving forward a little bit from that, um, with that kind of growing competition style and I guess comparing and contrasting that with the, the style of setting that you guys do, which is more for a general audience, um, how would you, as a route setter, determine your own success? How do you, how do you measure success in, let's, let's like narrow it down even further, like in a new set? How do you determine if that set was successful? Um, I don't think there's an like a, a specific answer. Yeah, I guess. Um, but like the simple answer is that every set should be balanced among styles, grades, like what it's teaching the new climbers. Like it should be fun, obviously. Yeah, I was <laughs> um, gonna say rule number one is that yeah should be fun. Yeah, it should be enjoyable. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And okay. so that's probably determined through probably four running. Yeah. And you guys run it afterwards. And, um, I noticed you guys, um, will, well, I don't know if you do it every time, but I, I noticed at some point you were actually kind of grading climbs in a quality standpoint. You know what I mean? Do you ever put like stars on climbs or anything like that? Yeah. We do that internally. Um, okay. when like time allows, cause yeah. that's like another huge part of this equation is like, obviously we want to set like bangers after bangers, right. but like we also need to like not make our company bankrupt <laughs> but, like so so there's that like that balance right there but yeah we do like internal like star grading system to talk about like okay what what's missing in this climb why is it not a four star climb yeah um so that's like super helpful for, for us and to like provide that quality to the the customer you know yeah so some you know setter to setter kind of kind of grading mm-hmm. each other's climbs i think that's i think it's good it's yeah. positive yeah we, we used to do the uh this might be what you're talking about the uh like public grading um we like yeah put tags on everything and said hey what grade do you think this is and what like star grade do you think this yeah. is yeah that, that was what i was thinking yeah. of and that, yeah. that was a little while back and yeah, that was a trip yeah and you get a lot of choss out <laughs> of that say, that was, <laughs> was interesting yeah <laughs> i remember i would always walk in and go walk over the tag and i'd be squinting <laughs> yeah, <it's>, what <laughs> what is happy excuse case? me <laughs> <laughs> did you climb the same climb i at least one time I saw people that could not do very much of the climb and also voted on the grade. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's fair. You know, if you, if you know you can't climb a certain grade, you can, you can vote at that grade. But, you know, some, I know specifically one time I had in mind, I watched like someone like touch a hold. 
<laughs> I was like, excuse me. <laughs> like I said, it all gets averaged out eventually, I guess. Yeah. But. And it, I guess in a much deeper line of reasoning, it doesn't really matter necessarily, but it is fun to play with. It's fun mm-hmm. to see what different people think about different climbs yeah. and that kind of feedback. Do you have um, ways of kind of dealing with the feedback that you get or, or do you get much feedback, I guess, directly from your consumers? Um, we, we do. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't get like that much like pointed feedback. It's yeah. usually like, Hey, that was fun or Hey, that was weird. But like even <laughs> something as, you know, insignificant as that, it's like, we still take that in and like, okay, so what, what was weird about that? Like, how can we fix what might've been weird? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you do a lot of, do you get like, um, any feedback during your one-on-one classes and stuff? Like during one-on-one, not really. Or like, I mm-hmm. guess you have only done two one once yeah. now. They don't really know what a drop knee is. Yeah. So yeah. that's rough. They can't like, really give me good feedback. Do you, like, <laughs> do you like seeing them fuck up all, literally all the beta? I, it's such a good time. <laughs> <laughs> These climbs that you set and they just, and I said, you're doing great, Kathy. <laughs> 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 no, but I really, I really do like to backpedal a bit. I love introducing people to the sport. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want to talk shit on those kinds of people. Yeah. It's, it's part of the experience. Anyone who's new at anything, yeah. you get yeah. you get razzed a little. Yeah, bit. yeah, that's that's fine. And beta is not natural. You got to learn. No, totally what taught. Yeah. <laughs> Very few people will step on the wall and do things like drop knees or mm-hmm. uh, you know back flagging. Or you know, a couple of times in my life, I have taken someone climbing and they'll like throw a back flag, and I'm like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> or or kids, kids are crazy. They, yeah, they do like intuitively all this stuff. It's wild. They just their bodies know. Yeah, we're meant to be climbing. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's, that's good. So you, I mean, feedback is, like I said, it can be a loaded term because it's, it's good that you guys don't get a lot of pointed or negative feedback because I think it probably speaks to your setting. I mean, if there was bad setting, I think at least the people that I know in our local gyms, I think they'd, they'd be telling people. Yeah. <laughs> they'd and, be and letting I mean, you know. <laughs> and I mean, we, we, we're like, we're also part of the, you know, climbing community. Yeah. So we're like there, we're talking with two people about like all the routes and like we're climbing the routes. So we have, I think, a pretty good gauge on what people enjoy and don't enjoy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that a lot of the feedback that we get is not really directed at us. Yeah, I can see that. Um, a lot of the times we'll set something, clo- like open up the section to the public, and then we'll just watch for a while. Yeah. Okay. And you can just get like a lot of nonverbal cues and behaviors and like overhear some people talking about things yeah and i feel like that's that's a really important thing to do yeah and just like having that like open source foreigning happening you just are watching like you get so much data from that like yeah. seeing mm-hmm. what people are doing like oh i thought you would do a drop knee here but i guess like at that grade it's not intuitive so like yeah. you factor that into the next thing you set so it, it is a whole lot of i guess nonverbal feedback that's interesting. So that's something that I think probably climbers don't think about. It's probably a route setter exclusive, you mm-hmm. know, is watching other climbers and to determine how they, you know, non-verbally react to the climb that they're on. That's, that's very interesting. I do it not for route setting perspective, but I just, I find it interesting to watch that kind of stuff anyways, like how people do climbs or people's body language specifically while they're climbing. You know what I mean? Is you see people go through the motions while they're climbing. Um, it's good to watch. It's an, it's an interesting experience. Yeah. It's cool to see that like a uh, little light bulb go off mm-hmm. when, yeah. when they figure it out. And that, then... I think that's one of the best feelings is yeah. to see people figure something out and it, and it just clicks. Mm-hmm. That's, that's almost when I, I feel like the most successful Yeah, is when something that isn't entirely forced gets figured out by somebody who climbs that grade. That is a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. And they, they they just light up and they go, Oh my God. Yeah, the cycling. Like, I they, just grabbed the volume, and they just like <laughs> they learned a thing that's with them for the rest of their mm-hmm. their climbing life. And even if they don't like recognize that at first, their body will immediately remember that. That's like ingrained to their movement profile. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll try that on another climb now, probably. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember very specifically the recent competition, Quattro de Mayo, men's three, when Michael uh, Zapata Bolduc. I think it's how you say his last name was doing men's three and we're watching you yeah. as he was figuring it out and you were no joke. You were bouncing up and down. on the <laughs> Yeah. I, I definitely the, the, threw both of my hands in yeah. there. And I yeah. Was, 
Yeah. That, that was his, so his problem too. Yeah. And I remember kind of going through the process a little bit of, uh, forerunning a little bit and then watching you guys tweak it and set it and then get forerun again and again mm-hmm. and watching that climb come together. Um, and then, you know, determining what was possible and it was cool. It was a cool climb. Yeah. I really liked that one. And, and, and end up being beta that we didn't really foresee, which is yes. even cooler. That's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Man, on-site finals are, oh man, it's like an emotional roller coaster. Yeah. You just never know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's like so much just stress and build up and then like, it always works out at the end, but yeah, I think for the first, what, two climbs, the men were separated like by one bonus or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. They were all tied. I was like, oh no. <laughs> and then we were thinking like, oh no, like three and four are going to be way too hard. Yeah. And then those two guys just figured it out. Yeah. yeah. I think Milo so flashed cool. it. He did. Milo actually flashed two through four. Yeah. He's a beast. Well, you, know, you know these scores better than we do. <laughs> I was I was very stoked. <laughs> I was watching very intently. Yeah, because yeah, um, I, I remember just that moment specifically, just this, the levels of stoke. The audience, you, Michael, because he was figuring it out. Like, mm-hmm. dude, the, the whole gym just exploded. Yeah, that's dope. And that's an awesome moment. And that's made possible by that climb. Yeah. I mean, everyone is part of that. But uh, without, you know, put it this way, if, if it was a climb that was not beta intensive, that was easy to figure out, but was really hard... Um, you'd see kind of a skill gap as opposed to like, uh, I don't know, like a beta gap, you know, people figuring it out because I think probably the first few climbers, I remember watching them just really having trouble figuring out the beta. Mm -hmm. They probably could have pulled through a couple of the moves if they had figured out the beta. All of them, like I know them, they can do that climb. Yeah. Um, in a vacuum, I guess, but yeah, Yeah. figuring out the beta and like not in four minutes. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the, that's the crux of the whole competition, I guess. Yeah. And just watching, I remember when Michael was the first one to get it, watching him kind of like standing there and like, you know, measuring it out. And everyone's like, you got it. <laughs> do that. What you're doing. Do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, the setters were just like, please get it. We yeah. need separation. <laughs> like, <laughs> we need someone to top this. <laughs> yeah. That's, I think people also that are not setters don't think about that. Like the stress that goes into it. I mean, especially for that situation. Dude, yeah. It's a it's a weekend. You were you were part of it. Yeah, you were there for the forerunning process. It's it's a headache and a half yeah. to to get the whole thing going. There's a, a lot of skin and effort that's just put into these routes. Yeah, and it's just great to see it like pay off, like you said. Like yeah. it, it just gets an emotional reaction from everybody, and we all had a really good time. Yeah, and that's climbing because of you, Michael and Milo. <laughs> Thanks, guys, and everybody else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, you strong fellows. <laughs> Saving these two seats for you guys. <laughs> Join us next week. <laughs> um, do you? That kind of brought a question for me. Forerunning and being part of that process brought a question to me specifically. Is that do you in that setting have specific climbers in mind, or even like in day to day setting? You know your your audience. You know mm-hmm. them personally a lot of the time. Do you set ever with specific climbers in mind? Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Usually for these bigger comps. Um, this one was kind of the exception, but usually we know most more more or less who exactly is coming. Okay. Um. So we'll know like, oh, this guy's not going to be able to make this span on problem theory, but he'll make up for it with this other thing. Um. And so like that's something we really look out for, especially in the uh like the women's category. Mm-hmm. Um. Because we'll know that, you know, f- five foot one youth girls coming in is going to make finals, and also Kelly Birch six foot two is going to be coming right. like so that's like something we have to prepare for and like be aware of yeah it's an it's, it's an interesting one yeah and also in just commercial setting too yeah we have to keep in mind that there are just so many different types of people that are coming into the gym and so sometimes we'll or at least i'll think like okay i'm going to set this for the smallest girl on the youth team mm-hmm. or i'm going to set this for um i don't know jim he just got off work and he loves to dino <laughs> And then Jim needs this. <laughs> Jim needs it. This will make his week. Me. <laughs> I'm Jim. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> but I think there's there's definitely like a few archetypes that you can look back to. Yeah. Um, and if we get kind of stuck, I think that's something we can look back on and say like, okay, we can think of the, a certain kind of person and then set something specifically for this sort of archetype. Yeah. And very rarely is you know, they're going to be like just one person who's stoked on that climb and everyone else is like, oh man, right. I mean, you're going to get, you know, groups of people and, and it'll separate out a little bit, but that's mm-hmm. climbing. Yeah. And there's even a chance that that person who fits that archetype won't like it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, 
that's out of our hands. Yeah. That's, I mean, you, you find that outdoors too. People go out and like, someone's like, Hey, like this climb, I think really suits your style. And then you get on it. <laughs> climb's trash <laughs> <laughs> or I'm trash. Not sure which one. <laughs> um, and kind of in the same vein of that is it, like knowing your audience and the audience growing and expanding. Um, also climbing at the rate that it's growing and expanding, there's more gyms than ever before. Uh, there's more climbers than ever before. Uh, by the nature of there being more gyms and more climbers, you know, basic supply and demand, you have more route setters now because there's more routes that need to be set. Um, do you think, and this one's, this one's tricky, but do you think that the increase in quantity has affected the overall quality of route setting in general? Do you think that gyms are forced to look for less experienced route setters just by sheer demand? Um, and do you think that, that affects route setting as a whole? Hmm. That's tricky because you can't go into gyms and be like, so tell me, like, how, how many years experience do your mm-hmm. route setters have? Because they're like, get out of here. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I, I think, like, the one of the, like, best, most, eh, what am I trying to say? I think one of the best things about becoming, like, a, a good or great setter is working, like, collaboratively with other setters. And I guess... In theory, if there's more setters, there should be more like collective growth. So I would say, like overall, as a trend, it should get be better. Okay. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and be devil's advocate a little bit. I think um, that working at Vital, I think we're a little spoiled, and in, in the sense that we have a very very solid team, okay. and we've trained people to work as a team. Mm-hmm. And I think. Like with you just setting for the competition at the Grotto and for me setting at the competition at the factory Mm -hmm. like a month or so ago, I think we realized that like teamwork feels totally different wherever we are. Mm -hmm. And so with where we are, like setting is a team effort and that's what makes us really, really great. And so I don't think that like the collaborative effort exists everywhere. Yeah. And I think that with the increase in popularity of climbing, I don't. I think it all just balances out. Like there's going to be more setters. So that means there's also going to be more setters who are going to take a little more time to be experienced yeah, and, and yeah. not be as quote unquote good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's true. That, uh, but there is like, I, I guess idealistically, there's a larger pool of good setters too. And that's yeah. hopefully enough to, yeah. you know, or like next year's good setters, you know, yeah. or the next mm-hmm. five years good right. setters. It all has to start somewhere. It's just that the melting pot in general is bigger now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's what it all comes down to. Yeah, and it's cool to see. I mean, uh, specifically in Southern California, we have a staggering amount of climbing gyms here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, a couple in the same city is is a pretty common occurrence. I know in other states where climbing is less popular, people will have to drive an hour, a couple hours to get to their climbing gym. Oh yeah. And I mean, I respect that. If you do that, that's awesome. Like, good for you because I drive 20 minutes and I'm like, dude, <laughs> do I have to go to the gym today? <laughs> I was driving here. I was like, man, he lives this far from the gym. <laughs> How does he climb ever? <laughs> <laughs> you have a hangboard. Just stay here. <laughs> that thing's totally safe to, to pull on. If oh, you yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. If you guys want so to... that two drywall screws, it's good to go. <laughs> <All right. laughs> those are not, those are not in studs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll rip that thing yeah. right out of the wall. <laughs> yeah, no time to look for studs. <laughs> Don't need those. Uh, yeah, and I mean, even just right here, I have uh, Rock Fitness, another climbing gym within five miles of me, and then Vital's probably 12-ish miles away from here. So, And then that's two gyms in a pretty close proximity, and then 20 miles up the freeway, there's another one or two. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. We got a ton down here, and they're busier now than they've ever been, and it's, it's an exciting time for climbing. Yeah. And I think that translates to an exciting time for route setters, too. Mm-hmm. There, there's like constantly uh people asking me to like hey, i want to set and like that 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 number is growing like every year because people are i mean more and more people are getting into the sport and getting into like the behind the scenes of the sport and like yeah. wanting to become part of it so that's that's awesome yeah it's cool to see more people getting involved in that kind of the not just climbing scene you know the business side of climbing mm-hmm. like what all is involved in that um do you do you, do you have advice for someone who would be looking to getting their start in setting um hmm. th- there's like i think a million different avenues to go i guess sure uh I, I think climbing is like first and foremost like i think every 
setter you know is probably a climber first and then a setter second. Um, not to say, like, setting is obviously very, very important to, to every setter. Yeah. But, like, climbing should be, like, the priority. Like, if I want to hire a setter, I'd rather hire the, the dirtbag who's been, like, living in Bishop for six months rather than the, the gym kid who's been, like, climbing all the routes that we've been setting. Um, if neither of them have experience, I guess. Okay. But, yeah, take that out of the yeah. equation. Interesting. Uh, to get a little more specific, I think, um, if you're setting right now and you're stuck in a rut or something, I think that uh, I got some of my best advice from Autre, honestly. Um, we were doing our reviews maybe like last year or something, and he told me, like, you should try and set a little more aesthetically. And that, that has totally changed and, like, improved my setting game completely. Yeah, I think I think just having, like, a, a pointed like thing to work on yeah Um, Yeah. like choosing one one weakness of yours and then addressing that for months and months and months and then choosing your next week weakness and addressing that and accepting that it takes years and years to even become decent like yeah i think i was talking about this yesterday i've been setting for five years now apparently (laughs) um (laughs) and like i'm still learning things literally every single day like just weird little things like oh i guess i never thought about how that flag doesn't work in this one scenario <laughs> like well, yeah i think that's i think that's like the best point is that we have weaknesses and i think some of my best routes have been produced by having some sort of a restriction okay so we've talked earlier about the challenges that we'll give each other and so if we say like i want you to set a hold that is blocked by another hold or something like that just being put in that uncomfortable position where you don't have control makes you just work a little differently. Yeah. And I think it's important for new route setters to constantly be doing that. And, and for experienced route setters. Yeah. Never be like content. I guess you should always yeah be pushing yourself. Always be hungry. Every route setter. You all suck. We all suck. Yeah. We yeah. gotta get better. Trash. <laughs> You guys are trash. <laughs> nice. I know, that's what I'm saying. Thank man. you. That, that's why we're here. <laughs> you what, what can we do better, Liam? Listen, let's <clears throat> let's talk dinos. All right. Okay. <laughs> I brought you here. I know. Today. <laughs> you static my dino earlier. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at those arms. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear? I, I very very shamelessly brought in even a Zoolander joke to make fun of his dino. I said, Sam, what is this? <laughs> a dino for ants? Yeah. <laughs> Man, you know, stoop that low. Yeah, you know it's really bad. When yeah. <laughs> quoting Zoolander. Right? <laughs> no, I, to to be fair, I loved that climb and the way it turned out. And all the iterations. Yeah, yeah. We Thanks. kept changing it, and I was like, sick. Yeah. Change it again, and I was Still like, sick. sick. Yeah. You got like four routes out of it. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> that You don't get that when you're not four routes. <laughs> this is true. You get the best... The, the best version. I want to encourage you, <laughs> encourage you that you all, if you climb it vital and you're listening to this, you guys are climbing the fine tuned, the polished version. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you, you guys probably couldn't even do it before. It was hard. <laughs> well, I mean, awesome stuff. I mean, you guys, the veteran, right? Atre Mac Mac Attack. Oh, this guy's this guy's a veteran. Head setter. We got Sam, artist on and off the wall. Thank you. Yeah. You guys are studs. Thanks for coming here tonight. Yeah, thanks for, thanks we should, for having us. We should keep talking just for a little bit. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about something like that isn't setting. Something that isn't setting? Yeah. Ooh. Why don't you just hijack yeah, the yeah, whole show? It? What just is kidding. It? Let's talk about Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> setting is like... <laughs> Have you ever played with Redstone? Minecraft. Redstone is hard to deal with. Uh, yeah. Dude, I've definitely, uh, I've definitely set a route in Minecraft before. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, uh, I guess it was like a, I don't even want to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it was a fucking cliff, and then you jump around, doesn't matter. <laughs> I need to see this, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> colored, colored wool and stuff, you know, for, yeah. for climbing holes. <laughs> okay, let's break that. Um, do you have any projects right now? Where are you, where are you climbing outside right now? That's a good question. I get outdoors exactly like one percent of as much as i would like to uh between this stuff vertical thoughts um and finding time to climb indoors or like some type of training and working like 50 hours a week 
I just, I have like very little time to get outdoors. Um, my current projects, there's a, just a spattering of stuff at Black Mountain. I would love to get on um, and finish. I've gotten on it, but I have not finished um, the Tour de France stand. Nice. I said, sorry, I'll have to take a back seat for now. Right? <laughs> Did you punt the mantle or? Um, more or less. Yeah, the mantle's <laughs> fucking hard. Yeah. The, mantle's <laughs> the bicycle was joyous for me. Yeah, yeah. I love a good bicycle. It's, it's such a good climb, and then you're like, oh, no, I have oh, to do God. this, like, SoCal <laughs> granite mantle. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. I have very little outdoor experience, actually. Hmm. So surprising for some people, but I have, I try to explain this like in the weirdest way possible, but I have been climbing outdoors like probably three or four dozen times, many times with friends. Uh, and many of those times I was not climbing. And for me that stemmed from like insecurity and growing up climbing with really strong climbers. I grew up climbing with my friends, Mark and Tanner, who both pull extremely hard, very good climbers outdoors. So oftentimes I would just watch, just like go hang out. I remember very specifically Mark was pulling on um, belly flop for a while that's fun yes did he I send was, did he do it no very oh. close nice. whoa we yeah. were actually talking about this the other day full full match on the the pinch that you kind of hit yeah and then just Brutal. swing swing yeah <laughs> that thing like broke or something right there's like a different start to it or it starts high or... i think so yeah. i think a low hold broke off yeah. i think you're right oh bummer but that's sick yeah climb. rough climb yeah climb sucks <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks chris sharma for that <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, getting projects outdoors is something this season I'm, I'm looking forward to. I'm, I got the guidebooks right there and I'm, I'm circling stuff, cool. getting outdoors a little more. And you should too, if you're listening to this, you should get outdoors more. Go with Sam and Autry. Climbing's cool. Go Climbing's find really them. Cool. Find them outdoors and just accost them. <laughs> <laughs> Go up to Sam when he's on the last hold of whatever his project is <laughs> and just start yelling out, I saw you on Vertical Thoughts. <laughs> I was like, thanks, Dad. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, I um, truly, I need to get out outdoors and climb more. Yeah, we, we, we got to make it happen this, this uh, winter. Yeah, totally. Fall. Let's do it. I haven't been to Bishop in many, many, many years. And I see, I've seen some pictures of both of you guys at Bishop, maybe not recently, but like a little ways back. I was there like three weekends ago, I yeah, think. So it might have been from then. We were there together. I traded his first V11. Mm-hmm. There. Yeah. You're nuts. Kill on site. That's Congrats. pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty cool climb. Autre V11 Mac. <laughs> <laughs> that's the new one, yeah. New nickname. <laughs> that's awesome. What about you guys? Projects outdoors? I'm working the stand start to that. Okay. Standing kill order. And I have fallen off the first move probably around 100 times. I've done every move several times, but yeah. I just can't link it for some reason. It's like super finicky first couple moves. Yeah. Um, tour sit mm-hmm. V10. That's a project for sure that we're both hoping to get. Um, I'm trying to think what else. There's like too many to even start yeah. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. There's like every time you go out, you like send one project and then you get 15 more. You know, I think one of my goals, I think this year, since I, I kind of broke through the barrier of getting V10, I think. Yeah. I just, I just want to climb everything. Like I don't even want to shoot for any next grade. Yeah. I just want to get on new stuff and learn more. Maybe try and stay healthy. Yeah. Not injured. Oh, that's that's the thing we didn't really talk about is fucking staying healthy as a setter. That's that's hard. That's very difficult. I can imagine. I mean, yeah. like uh, that's that's interesting that you said that because that happened to me recently. It's interesting how breaking through a plateau can change your like whole perspective on climbing. And like mine was even just, just indoors because I don't climb outdoors much. But when I when I did my first V8, literally, like I walked into the gym the next day and I was like, all these climbs, okay, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of that session, I was pretty much back. But <laughs> I was like, I can do anything. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing like what that like arbitrary like next number does to your psyche, I guess. It's, it's just nuts. like all of a sudden like, oh, all these doors opened. Now I got to go try all this, yeah. this stuff. Like it's cool. I like that though, like breaking through your plateau. And then just no longer pushing for another plateau, Mm -hmm. but just like going down and experiencing Mm -hmm. all the awesome lower grades. Yeah, it's it's all about building pyramids, Yeah, not towers. That's a very challenging thing to do. Yeah. Because, of course, there's a couple V11s I want to look at. Right. But I know there's there's some things I need to work on. Yeah. I have this dog here that he needs to go to the vet. 
I need uh, strong fingers. Same. I need another beer. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> Last time we were in here with um, with Kobe and Xavier, we I put on um, Sleepwalker on the TV just so I could show them the climb because we were talking about that kind of like group dynamic and how all of them were there working that together. But then we talked about uh, uh, Burn of Dreams, the Lapinor project, and how it was just Nale alone in the woods. I don't know how you have power mental screening. fortitude for that. Yeah. That's crazy. I, dude, if I'm in the gym and like it's just me, not even outdoors, just in the gym and I like, uh, I try too hard a couple times, I'm like, man, get this, man, come back tomorrow. <laughs> but he'd like, yeah. something like 80 or something sessions mm-hmm. on one climb. And nine seasons or something. Yeah. By him. Like a lot of the time, he was by himself too. Was that uh, was it in that that movie where there's like clips of uh, woods and who else? Uh, Webb Web. trying it, mm-hmm. like just getting stomped. Yeah. It's like hilarious. <laughs> Isn't that crazy to see? That's wild. Yeah, like not even close to any of the moves. That's crazy. That climb was something else. Oh yeah, not like something else. Beautiful boy. Yeah, what's he up to right now? Price the next nine A. He's out there somewhere in the middle of finland alone <laughs> yeah it's power screen <laughs> <laughs> that's what i think about i like wake up in the middle of the night is that nolan i wonder what nolan is doing <laughs> <laughs> I, I think i just heard him screaming <laughs> <laughs> we made that joke when we were driving up to black one night where you know like the stereotypical your headlights kind of pan as you're turning i made the joke where like all of a sudden it would just stop and it's just like chris sharma like naked on the <laughs> it's just like, and he just like looks at and scurries off <laughs> scurries up the wall <laughs> <laughs> runs into the wilderness <laughs> or no, it was cosmos we were driving by cosmos oh, and it yeah, like yeah. we lit up the boulder for, for a second and i just imagine him like it's like his fucking eyes like reflecting like the <laughs> <laughs> a big hairy like sasquatch <laughs> chris sharma <laughs> oh, man. well yeah thanks for coming yeah this, this is cool this is yeah. cool yeah. i love talking climbing yeah and we do too yeah climbing's pretty cool it's cool talking with somebody else about climbing instead of just <laughs> instead of just us hey just you want to hang out later yeah dude. <laughs> you want to watch the new rewatch? <laughs> yeah actually i recommend it yeah <laughs> final thoughts last words well that was maybe a little more not last words <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to kill these fine gentlemen tonight <laughs> maybe uh, I, don't, I don't know man i don't i don't have anything to say Same. thanks for thanks for having us of course this is a, a cool thing that you're doing i'm stoked um for all you route setters out there and aspirants, just, just know that you suck. <laughs> you will always suck. And we suck, too. Yeah, we suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We all suck. Yeah, the, that go. boy thick, the lion. Remember these names and faces. Oh, if you're listening and not watching on YouTube, go to YouTube and look at their faces and then remember those. You don't want to do that. Let me, let me take these off. <laughs> you can see this. Yeah, Get main. Oh, oh, God. I think I hit the mic. Okay, that's pretty good. I think my dog is going to shit on your ground. Cool. That's a good time to end the show. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> See ya. Later. <laughs>